One more minute. Two minutes, sir. Network issues is there. Yes, sir. You can go. Yeah, you can start. Yeah. Yeah, good evening. Can you hear me, Loda? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. Good evening to one and all. Yellow Namaskara, Bharati Vedika Sangha, Kanada Karaja Shakya Parvagi. Can you hear me? Loda, can you hear me? Unmute yourself. Unmute. Amadu. Loda, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I can, I can hear you. Yeah, yeah. Okay, hello, Namaskara. Bharat Vedika Sangha, Kannada Graja, Sakya Paravagi. Even though webinar game, Tamge Ardhik Swaga Tavanna Korta. Namma Dehada Khayle Gada Chetege. Auto Auto Gali. Namma Shereere Ke Bharata Kanta, Aakta Kanta, Halavaru Gaya Gali Ke. Chikitsen Nidita Kanta Undishtu Avashyakate Nama Mele Ne Initnali Eidina Namjutage Sports Injury Gala Specialist Agir Tha Kanta Dr. Rudra Prasad Matho Dr. Chiraga Vari Dara Undishtu Expert Opinion Gala Na Avar Nidhi Dara Avar Gis Vagata Vanna Korta Karakter Mamna Munnats Kodu Bekka Agi Dr. Malayu Gaudara Na Dr. Madhu, Madhu, yeah. recording is the background. Dr. Madhu, 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 Unmute mode kadi. Unmute mode kadi. Mm 
ಮನೆಗೂಡ ಅನ್ಮಿಟ್ ಮಾಡ್ಕೊಳ್ಳಿ ಸಿರಾಕ್ ಸರ್ ಅನ್ಮಿಟ್ ಇವ ಸರ್ ಗೌಡ ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಕ್ಯಾರಿ ಆರ್ ಹಲೋ ಗುಡ್ ಈವ್ನಿಂಗ್ ಎವ್ರಿವನ್ ನವೇ ಡೇಸ್ ಮೋಸ್ಟ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಪೀಪಲ್ ಆರ್ ಇಂಟರ್ ಗೆಟಿಂಗ್ ಇಂಟರ್ಜ್ ಇನ್ ಟು ಸ್ಪೋರ್ಟ್ಸ್ ಆಕ್ಟಿವಿಟೀಸ್ ಫಾರ್ ದೇರ್ ಹೆಲ್ತ್ ಫಿಟ್ನೆಸ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಅದರ್ ರೀಸನ್ಸ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಆಲ್ಸೋ ನವೇ ಡೇಸ್ ಮೆನಿ ಪೀಪಲ್ ಮೆನಿ ಪೀಪಲ್ ಮೆನಿ ಸ್ಟೂಡೆಂಟ್ಸ್ ಆರ್ ಟೇಕಿಂಗ್ ಅಪ್ ಸ್ಪೋರ್ಟ್ಸ್ ಆಸ್ ದೇರ್ ಕೆರಿಯರ್ ಸೊ ಅಟ್ ದಿಸ್ ಜಂಕ್ಚರ್ ದಿಸ್ ವೆಬಿನಾರ್ ಸ್ಪೋರ್ಟ್ಸ್ ಇಂಜುರೀಸ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಪ್ರಿವೆನ್ಷನ್ ಈಸ್ ಎ useful for many and i think it's useful for many many so and uh, on this webinar today we have two eminent speakers one is uh, dr rudra prasad he is a senior con- consultant and associate professor at indira gandhi institute of child health in pediatric orthopedics and he is a arthroscopy and uh, sports injury specialist at uh, prasad ortho care and uh, spurs hospital and he is also a president of Bangalore Arthroscopy Club. He is also faculty at various conferences at national and uh, international uh, conferences. And he is also a trainer in the Kedavar lab. Welcome you, sir. And Madhu, can you hear me? Yeah. And we have another consultant, Dr. Chirag Tase. He is a consultant ortho and arthroscopy surgeon at Vikram Hospital, Bangalore. He has got special interest in shoulder and knee surgeries. He trains extensively in India and abroad. And he is also running a fellowship program at, in orthoscopy. They are well trained in uh, sports medicine and uh, sport, treating uh, uh, sports injuries. On this juncture, I request them, uh, Dr. Chirag, to go ahead with uh, his thoughts. Over to you, sir. Yeah, thank you, sir. thank you thank you for the kind invitation uh, on the outset before i uh, start my presentation i would like to uh, thank the indian medical association state chapter the president the office bearers and especially dr manu gowda for taking an initiative and on this front now we all know that uh, the sports injuries the scenario of sports injuries in india have have changed in the recent past and we all know that uh, it's it's very important that we as doctors uh, are well aware of what kind of sports injuries can our patients encounter and what are the best possible treatment mod- modalities present in today's case scenario and also uh, what is the best preventive measures we could advise our patients in this front uh, in the nutshell uh, it's it's an emerging upcoming field of orthopedics and in uh, in the field of medicine and uh, a special interest in this field uh, would uh, would definitely help us in our day to day practice to start off with what is sports injuries now now what are we go- what is the aim and objective of this meeting uh, is to discuss what are sports injuries how do we diagnose them how do we treat, treat them and what are the preventive measures we could advise to our patients uh, who are suffering from these uh, sports injuries now we all know uh, the theme of orthopedics is nothing else but uh, moment is life now to have this moment we should have supple good mobile joints so the moment primarily happens in the joints and uh, to compensate for this or to complement to this is the soft tissues which are nothing else but the muscles and the other soft tissues which surround the joints hence it's very important that uh, a good mechanics of of, of a joint uh is is complemented with good soft tissues that's nothing else but the joint capsule ligaments tendons fascias and of course the cartilaginous tissues which could be either the labrum meniscus uh, so on and so forth now mechanisms a uh, mechanism of a good movement now when we, when we talk about a good movement one an athlete or a sportsman should have a good supple joint uh, which is mobile um, um, to achieve his uh, sporting goals or his uh, or sporting activities uh, not only the uh, joint and the soft tissues are important here it's also the nervous system which brings about the neuromuscular coordination um, uh, which is important in our uh, in treating these sportsmen hence a thorough understanding 
of uh, the soft tissues, the joint, and the neuro, uh, neuro uh, nervous structure of the body is very important uh, when we treat our sportsmen. Now, the nine components which, uh, which are important for a good movement of the joint uh, is a good mobility, good soft tissue flexibility, muscle strength, joint stability, endurance, speed, power, agility, and coordination. Uh, this is a comprehensive uh, uh, treatment which, which uh, one needs to provide to a sportsman to get back to their normal sports and to uh, have a good endurance in their sporting activities. Uh, what's important? And now we need to know that any abnormal mechanics leads to pain, dysfunction of the joints and soft tissues. What are sports injuries? Now, sports injuries result for, from an acute trauma or a repetitive stress injuries associated with athletic events. Uh, now, the sports injuries can affect bones, soft tissues such as ligaments, muscles, or tendons. How do we classify these sports injuries? Now, let's let's briefly look into how we can classify these sports injuries. Uh, looking at broadly, one could classify them as an acute injury or a chronic injury, a direct injury or an indirect injury. A direct injury is because of an impact uh, or a collision. A direct collision can cause uh, damage to a tendon, bone, muscle, or ligament. And these injuries are classified as direct injuries, whereas a non-contact injury are indirect injuries. Assuming a patient is playing a pivoting sport, like in what we see here in the figure, and the patient is not in contact with the, any other athlete, but he himself has a twisting movement of a joint, and then he sustains some form of an injury, or else a, a person is sprinting and he pops off his uh, hamstring tendon. These are called the indirect injuries where the, uh, the, the uh, victim or the patient doesn't come in contact with any other sportsman, but hence, uh, but still sustains some form of an injury. These are called the indirect injuries, and these are what we see uh, in higher-end athletes uh, of late. And there could be a soft tissue injury, as I said, a muscle injury, a muscle contusion, a, a ligament injury, uh, or else uh, any other soft tissue injuries like the tendon injuries or a fascia injury. Uh, a heart tissue injury could be nothing else but a break in the bone, which is called as a fracture. What are overuse injuries? Overuse, overuse injuries are sustained from continuous repetitive stress, incorrect techniques or equipments, or too much of training. Now, this is something which we need to keep in mind. We all come across a lot of athletes who are overloaded or overburdened uh, by the coaches, by the trainers, and, and they're pushed beyond their endurance level to perform some, uh, some uh, to achieve certain goals. And these are the athletes who are prone for these repetitive stress injuries. Um, uh, these are uh, the repetitive uh, stress injuries. Um, yeah, maybe uh, overuse is the uh, is the, uh, the, uh, the person or the patient is the victim and there's an underlying cause or the culprit. Now, what are these culprits? It could be either, either the intrinsic abnormality, the extrinsic abnormality, that's the external factors, or a sports-induced deficiencies. Now, by large, as uh, Dr. Malvi Gaudo was telling us, that most of these patients coming to us with sports injuries are either uh, the children of the, of the adolescent age group. And these are the patients who are more prone for uh, these kind of a repetitive stress injuries or, or an overuse injury or an abuse injury. And uh, one, one, one thing about these uh, adolescent age group is that their cartilage or the growth plate is susceptible for such, such kind of injuries. And this has to be kept in mind when we, uh, when we treat these patients. Intrinsic factors. What are the intrinsic factors which could predispose to over overuse injuries? Uh, a previous injury, a malalignment of the limb, uh, psychological issues, muscle imbalance, inflexibility, muscle weakness, or instability. So we need to keep into my uh, keep into account or take into account all these kind of uh, factors and then make an make a comprehensive decision as in how we go about with these these kind of injuries. Extrinsic extrinsic injuries uh, could be because of training, improper recovery. Improper equipment, which is very, very common in our, uh, in our scenario, unlike the West, a poor training technique. So this is very important that the coach or the trainer does understand the, the normal biomechanics of, of the patient. And hence, it's very important. Uh, it's an onus on us as the physicians or as surgeons uh, to make, uh, make understand the coaches and the trainers as in what is the proper technique and uh, what is the endurance level of each athlete uh, uh, where one could undergo training. A training error is something which really brings about these kind of uh, injuries. Now, it's a vicious cycle. When you overload a muscle or a tendon, tendon or a muscle or tendinous junction, there's a dim damage to the muscles or there's a micro tears in these muscles or tendons. Uh, there's subclinical adaptation. Now, what happens in these, uh, these athletes 
or or sportsmen they they push to a, a certain level their their uh, their pain tolerance is a little better hence a little bit of a recovery is considered as a recovery and they they uh, they eventually subclinically adapt to these conditions uh, they adapt to muscular weaknesses they adapt to inflexibilities they uh, they they overlook the scar tissues and uh, hence the muscle strength imbalance which would lead on to a subtle uh, biomechanical uh, imbalance and hence uh, overloading the tissues again and causing uh, grievous injuries now uh, let me brief you uh, or brief the audience how one could manage uh, 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 overuse injury let's just look into this pyramid the first step or the base of the pyramid is to make an accurate diagnosis until unless we have an accurate diagnosis there's no proper treatment first thing what once one one diagnosis the next step uh, towards our aim is to control the inflammation promote healing then then get on to fitness exercises control abuse of that part and uh, gradual progression to an uh, active sports participation and now make a proper or, or accurate diagnosis this is the first step as i said first step to achieving our goal is to make an uh, accurate pathological diagnosis an accurate history a thorough physical examination a good biomechanical evaluation and uh, uh, selected diagnostic tests which could be uh, which could be well done uh, in certain labs and uh, in current day scenario we have good labs which could uh, biomechanically assess the patients which could get give us a good foot analysis which would give us a good gait analysis and also give us an endurance uh, uh, analysis of the patient uh, in terms of uh, uh, mus- neuromuscular coordination now we need to control the inflammation whenever a uh, part of the body is damaged it's a simple price protocol which we follow in any trauma or or any sort of uh, sports injuries one is to protect the uh, joint or protect the bone or protect the limb next is to rest uh, ice compression elevation you all know any part which is damaged needs to be elevated to bring down the edema or to suppress the further uh, enhancement of this uh, uh, of the edema in that limb uh medications titrated it, no, it should not be abused and other mortalities like in icing cryo or uh, or, or anything any external mortalities um, uh, could be taken into account now promoting healing this uh, here comes the role of an orthopedic surgeon or an arthroscopic surgeon or a sports surgeon where one could advise a therapeutic exercises of course the sports sports physiotherapists also do play a, a pivotal role in the in, in the healing of these tissues and uh, in promoting healing Uh, they need to correct the weaknesses and the imbalance, imbalances in case one would require any form of an injection in terms of uh, growth enhancing injections one could go ahead with that and uh, if nothing else works then a selective corrective surgical intervention is something one should not hesitate uh, going ahead with now uh, let me Uh, uh, that was a brief about the sports injuries and uh, how one could sustain the sports injuries how could how one could prevent sports injuries or or a brief about uh, in short about how one could uh, uh, assess or diagnose the sports injuries now let me uh, let me go into uh, joint specific shoulder injuries since i am going to cover the upper limb which is nothing else by large but the shoulder Uh, and the second half is going to be covered by dr rudra prasad that's the lower limb especially the knee and ankle joints which 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 forms by large 90% of uh, of our sports injuries which we encounter now the shoulder injuries what kind of a pathology could we find in a sportsman a sportsman could either come to us with an unstable shoulder he could come with a stiff shoulder or he could come with painful stiff shoulder so these are different spectrum of uh, pathologies which which are seen in in Uh, shoulder injuries as i said stiff shoulder relaxed shoulder or a painful shoulder uh, um, to some about problems of motion especially stiffness this is nothing else but the frozen shoulder is the most common complaint the patient comes with it's not only the elderly diabetic patients who come to us with uh, frozen shoulder problems they could be younger population which have had some subtle injuries in the in the shoulder joint which are overlooked which are neglected and this leads on to something called the secondary frozen shoulder uh, and hence the motion or the mobility of the joint is completely restricted and the patient presents to us with uh, with symptoms of uh, frozen shoulder problems of stability especially the traumatic glenohumeral uh, instability what we call as a recurrent dislocation of the shoulder is something which we 
see very very commonly in sportsmen and these are the patients who are uh, uh, very apprehensive of using their upper limb or their shoulder uh, to play any form of sports and at certain angles this their shoulder dislocates again and again leading on to a condition called the recurrent dislocation of the shoulder which needs to be th uh, recognized thoroughly evaluated and properly treated now problems of strength rotator cuff lesions we have all heard about rotator cuff injuries and these are one of the very very common uh, injuries seen in patients uh, especially who are uh, who are involved in um, certain weight lifting activities uh, so on and so forth now problems of smoothness uh, this is uh, this is a um, uh, this is a problem which has been under the blanket and most of us do not recognize uh, these problems especially the sub, uh, subacromial uh, impingement syndromes and degenerative diseases um, uh, like as in uh, acromioclavicular joint arthropathy which is very very common in uh, people involved in overhead activities which are overlooked by most of us and the patients are never happy now let's look into the age group of uh, this is a small study done as in what age group of uh, patients present with what problems and now if you look into uh, in, uh, age group between 30 to 40 years these are the sporting populations who usually uh, the maximum uh, number of patients presenting in this age group with shoulder problems are patients who have had traumatic instability that means uh, recurrent shoulder instabilities and the patients who come with uh, partial rotator cuff uh, tendon injuries now uh, let's look into the brief anatomy of the of the uh, shoulder and what kind of a lesion can occur where when there's a lesion in the glenoid labrum that is the socket which is called a, which has a washer called the labrum and when there's a tear in this washer it's called the bankart's tear this leads on to the instability and in certain um, uh, uh, grievous form of this is is something called the bony bankart's lesion where not only the soft tissue but also the bone uh, in this glenoid socket is involved which leads on uh, to a much more unstable shoulder called the bony bankart's bony bankart's lesion a slap lesion this is another variant of a of a labral tissue injury wherein uh, uh, the labrum is detached from the superior surface a slap is nothing else but the superior labral anterior and posterior hence this is a multidirectional injury it could either be in one plane or two planes and these kind of an injuries are most commonly seen in patients who are involved in overhead uh, activities like badminton um, uh, um, tennis and and swimmers rotator cuff tears most commonly uh, seen in uh, as i said in weightlifters it could also be traumatic when patient falls on the shoulder and hence uh, damages his rotator cuff especially with the fall in an abducted and outstretched arm one could have a rotator cuff tear a posterior labral tear is as in a bankart's lesion which could uh, occur in the anterior portion of the labrum one could have a posterior a posterior labral tear and one could have an instability in the posterior part now never to overlook the soft tissues around the the shoulder now when a patient complains or comes to us with a shoulder problem or a shoulder girdle problem we always think of an intraarticular pathology and we tend to overlook the muscular part of it and one of the most common cause for a upper limb pain or a, or a pain in the shoulder girdle is something called the trapeziitis or the fibromyalgia and uh, uh, the patients who present uh, to us with these kind of a problems especially the trapeziitis trapeziitis is nothing else but the inflammation of the trapezius muscle if you see here a trapezius muscle is a huge muscle arising from the nape of the neck and up to the middle of the spinal cord um, and and this is a, a double triangle uh, junction where where one could have multiple tender spots uh, fatigue a uh, pain uh, and soreness in this muscle which could further on lead to lead to multiple trigger spots which is called the fibromyalgia these have to be treated with anti inflammatories and certain other medications and of course physical therapy in terms of trapezius manual release and uh, trapezius stretches is is something which is very very helpful and useful uh, for these patients to relieve their pain and stiffness impingement syndrome we have all heard about it uh, what is an impingement impingement is nothing else but a pinch now where does where what pinches is here now this is an acromion that's the bone on the top of the shoulder and this is the humeral head uh, and uh, the uh, humeral tubercle now the tissues between this acromion and the humeral head is what gets pinched especially in in uh, while raising the arm in in overhead abduction uh, in forward flexion one could have a pinch of these tissues like this and cause an impingement syndrome it's the bursal tissue 
and it's the and it's the tendon tissue which gets impinged and which gets inflamed and in certain moments of the arm there's a sharp shooting pinching pain especially what we call it as a painful arch syndrome when the arm is abducted from somewhere around 45 degrees to 120 degrees there's a painful arch and uh, the patient winces with pain in this moment and hence uh, the patient is very apprehensive to perform certain overhead activities and one of the culprits what we see Uh, causing this kind of a problem is a, a normal pathological variant of this acromion bone, especially this type three acromion. We see here it's like a hook rather than being flat. The acromion is hooked acromion, and it's reducing the space between the humeral head and the and the acromion, uh, reducing the coracoid acromion. I mean, humeral uh, acromion humeral distance, and hence causing impingement. Uh, X-ray. easy pick, uh, easy um, uh, way to diagnose these spurs is to get a get a good view of an x ray and to identify these kind of uh, type 3 acromions and spurs sometimes these kind of uh, uh, this kind of supraspinatus tendonitis could be a chronic problem leading on to calcification of the tendon and hence this pathology is called as a calcific tendonitis as we see here the rotator cuff insertion is calcified and this uh, this condition is called as a calcific tendonitis which may well be appreciated even on an mri scan the treatment options rest anti inflammatories physiotherapy in terms of local uh, ultrasound shoulder shrugs scapular retractions physical therapies uh, stabilize the scapula if that doesn't give any relief use a local cortisone injection uh, if nothing else works uh, then one should always go ahead and decompress the subacromial space uh, which is called as a subacromial decompression where one would decompress uh, the uh, inflamed bursa and uh, the spur of the bone which which is the which is the culprit as we see here a simple uh, straight forward arthroscopic surgery where one would take the arthroscopic burr and the spur which is uh, which is projecting out there uh, impinging on the tissues could be well uh, burred out with a simple straight forward procedure and the patient could be treated now how do the anger patients present to us with as i said either instability incomplete cuff tears and complete cut cuff tears Uh, in a chronological order, uh, instabilities are the maximum number of patients, younger patients, sports, sporting individuals who come to us, uh, and uh, furthermore, the cuff tear patients. Now, shoulder instability. Shoulder instability, by and large, when we talk about a shoulder instability, is nothing else but a glenohumeral instability where where uh, where it's difficult for the uh, for the individual to maintain. this uh, humeral head or the ball in the socket and hence in certain moments uh, the ball or the or the uh, uh, humeral head pops out of the socket and uh, hence causing a great amount of discomfort and restriction of movement now if you see here this this picture a section of actual section of your of our uh, of our shoulder once once sees that the humeral head is about three times larger than the glenoid uh, so, glenoid socket now how does this how is this uh, head Uh, maintained in the socket, or how is it uh, restrained in the socket? It's because of certain tissues, of certain soft tissues uh, called as the and the main uh, structure is called the glenoid labrum. Now, this glenoid labrum acts like a bumper. It it prevents the subluxation of the head out. It increases the contact surface area, and also there are certain ligaments which are attached to this labrum, which provides uh, restraint or which provides. Uh, um uh, which prevents the humeral head from from dislocating or subluxating from the joint as we see here this is the most important ligament called as the inferior glenohumeral ligament that is the inferior inferior portion this is the glenoid and this is the humerus so the ligament which attaches from the glenoid rim to the humeral head provides a restraint to the subluxation of the head in in a moment of arm arm in abduction and external rotation let's take an example simple example of an hammock this is the humeral head and this is the glenoid glenohumeral inferior glenohumeral ligament this acts like an hammock the the person here is relaxing well in place well seated now when one has an has a tear in this in this hammock or in the in the ligament what happens one would just pop out or fall out of the of place in certain moments and that's exactly what happens to our shoulder it subluxates or dislocates and the culprit is nothing else but a bankart's lesion as we can see here on the image the glenoid rim which is firmly attached here with the inferior glenohumeral ligament is torn 
and uh, hence uh, the uh, the uh, the integrity of the jo shoulder joint is compromised and uh, one could have a dislocation of the shoulder uh, the, there are various variants like you know when when the glenoid is uh, torn along with the labrum and a piece of the bone it's called the bony bankers lesion uh, furthermore one could have a bony bankers lesion and this portion of the humeral head could get hitched on this portion of the bone of the glenoid rim and cause an impact fracture on uh, on on, uh, on these uh, on on the humeral head leading on to a lesion called the hill sacs lesion this is what we see on the mri reports most commonly we see a bankers lesion or bony bankers lesion or a hill sacs lesion uh, which needs to be identified and treated now look at these patients these are the patients who are dislocating or subluxating their shoulders by themselves these are these are called the atraumatic instabilities instabilities these are these are habitual dislocators and they dislocate the shoulder in multi direction these are the subset of patients who needs to be recognized because they are hyperlax and the treatment needs to be tailored for them it is the, the, when we talk about the shoulder dislocation it could be either traumatic dislocation which are seen in sportsmen or else it could be a multi directional habitual dislocations which are seen in hyperlax individuals so we need to differentiate between uh the two subluxators uh, subluxators are automatic subluxators subluxators dislocators and uh, and uh, atraumatic dislocators uh, a simple test what one could do uh, to identify this dislocation shoulder dislocations is to translate the humeral head over the glenoid like as, as in i'm doing it in this patient here uh and one sees that the uh, uh, that, that the uh, that the ball of the humerus is moving uh, much in advance than it's moving backwards this is called a simple test called the apprehension test when you abduct and external rotate the shoulder the patient is uh, wincing of pain and is apprehensive and he restrains or uh, protects that movement and this is called as a uh, apprehension test if this is positive one could one should always suspect a lesion called the bankers lesion now how do we treat this uh, if the patient is dislocating the first time one could reduce the shoulder uh, put them on an arm pouch or put them on a shoulder immobilizer for 3 weeks and then start on gentle uh, rehab Uh, if that is not suffice if the patient comes back uh, towards again with the second dislocation or the patient comes towards with recurrent dislocation uh, uh, one would well go ahead and and suggest an arthroscopy that's a, that's a simple keyhole procedure and uh, one could uh, uh, the torn labrum is then tied back to the glenoid um uh, in this fashion where uh, where uh, the uh, normal anatomy of the shoulder joint is restored and one could have a good function in further date Uh, this is a very successful and uh, useful procedure and uh, these kind of procedures needs to be understood and performed in in patients who are in need um, patients do uh, do extremely well with good range of movement and and um, and good mobility of the shoulder that these patients are happy patients and they return back to the normal sports that's the aim of uh, treating any sportsman and now slap lesions as i as i mentioned before slap lesion is nothing else but a tear in the glenoid labrum now if you see here the biceps tendon gets attached to the labrum of of the of the glenoid and uh, people who are involved in overhead activities swimmers badminton players this biceps tendon could get peeled off along with this uh, glenoid rim and this lesion is called the slap tear which is nothing else but the superior labral tear anterior and posterior And, uh, the patients do have fair amount of discomfort 90% of the these kind of lesions can be treated conservatively with good physical therapy and good rehab program and uh, there are some small subset of patients who uh, have who seem to have persistent problems and these are the patients who need to be uh, recognized uh, diagnosed and treated with surgical interventions now rotator cuff tear we all of us know that there are four four rotator cuff uh, tendons what are they in the front we have the sub uh, subscapularis in the top we have the supraspinatus and the back we have the infraspinatus and and gyrus minor on all of these tendons the first three tendons do blend together and form the rotator cuff on the top and the subscapularis tendon is attached in the in the in the front now what are the functions we need to first rec recognize or we need to recollect what are the functions of this rotator cuff tendons to make make our understanding much more simpler and clinically we can diagnose these kind of a tears now supraspinatus tendon brings about abduction infraspinatus brings about external rotation teres minor uh, minor is involved in external rotation and the internal rotation is aided by the subscapularis tendon now rotator cuff tendons are uh, are, are are tendon tears are common in sportsmen 
uh, especially uh, traumatic injury can cause this kind of full thickness rotator cuff tear. And these are the patients who are unable to sustain their arm in abduction. They drop their arm drops in abduction. When you when you ask the patient to hold uh, the arm in abduction, they are not unable to sustain it, and the arm drops. This is called the drop arm test. In case of a complete rotator cuff uh, tear, he is also able to uh, unable to sustain the arm in external rotation, and hence uh, the arm falls forward. In subscapular tears, what happens? The patient is unable to internally rotate his uh, or, or sustain his uh, shoulder in internal rotation. One, one cannot blow like a horn blower. One cannot tuck his belly in this fashion. And these are the, these are the tears which needs to be recognized and treated. And sometimes the patient can come with um, a picture like a pseudoparalysis where the patient is unable to move his arm, the patient requires to use his other arm and then he abducts or lifts his arm. And these are the patients who have complete rotator cuff tear. Uh, the patients can also present with stiffness and weakness in case they are, they are neglected. What, what, how do we treat a rotator cuff uh, uh, tear? The, uh, the treatment of the rotator cuff tear in a sportsman depends on what profession or what profile of a patient uh, do we have, the size of the location, uh, the symptoms with which the patient comes to us with the quality of tissue which is torn and of course the other decision uh, other injuries uh, the uh, the simultaneous injuries what one would have sustained uh, during this episode treatment options partial tears can be conserved uh, with analgesics and physiotherapy prp injection is a good option for partial rotator cuff tears Subacromial steroid injection, if the patient is an uh, athlete who needs to play a game, who's, uh, who it's, it's about his career, uh, they could be pushed, uh, pushed with a small uh, steroid injection shot uh, until unless he completes his uh, season and then uh, the definitive treatment could be done. Lifestyle modification, um, of course, it's a lot to talk about in this forum right now. Uh, repair is a very good option, uh, in, in, especially in uh, people who have got functional compromises, the, uh, the mobility, uh, the pain, uh, there's a compromise in the mobility, there's a compromise in the strength, the patient is uh, having pain, which is not subsiding with the physiotherapy and other modalities, one could well go ahead and repair uh, these kind of rotator cuff tears with simple, straightforward arthroscopic procedures, um, you know, especially uh, these tears which are completely torn and retracted as we see here. This is a complete supraspinatus tear uh, seen uh, in a young athlete. He is unable to abduct his arm uh, with good strength. He is having pain. He is unable to perform his normal sporting activities. He's a basketball player. Um, uh, these patients do well with a simple straightforward keyhole procedure uh, called a shoulder arthroscopic procedure where we uh, anchor the uh, sutured tendon back to the bone uh, uh, and, and hence um, aim for an absolute recovery of the shoulder. Advantages of arthroscopic surgeries in today's date, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a small surgery in, in the sense the incisions are small, the recovery is quicker, uh, the visualization of the tendons, ligaments inside the joint, maybe knee or shoulder is much better the tissues which are damaged can be mobilized well and, uh, and uh, an intraoperative decision can be taken as in what to be done uh, with these kind of uh, tears. And, and these uh, surgical interventions could be performed with, uh, with certain blocks or, in, or, in, or with general anesthesia. Uh, to sum up, uh, sports injuries are, uh, are very common in today, today's uh, scenario where all of us, uh, especially in the lockdown, post-lockdown, there will be a lot of patients of us who would want to get back to their normal sporting activities, who would want to shed some weight which they have put on in the last six to seven months' time. And uh, there are some over enthusiastic patients who need to be counseled about what kind of uh, sports injuries uh, they can encounter and what are the best possible preventive measures one could, uh, one could take in, in, in these uh, situations. Uh, once again, I would like to yeah. thank the. Yeah. the Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yes, for providing this one. <clears throat> yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. It's an extensive talk. So we'll go ahead with uh, Dr. Rudra Prasad talk. Yes. Before we take, take up questions. Sir, we can start, sir. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Malwe Goda. And... Um, 
Uh, how much time do do I have? Because I think uh, we have overshot a little bit of time, so no, that I can. Okay, okay. I carry on, sir. We'll see. Okay. Anyway, thanks uh, to all of you for organizing this wonderful meet uh, to share uh, certain aspects of the sports injuries. As I know that uh, Dr. Malve Gowda is very much into sports, and uh, we we had uh, together ran a marathon at Ubli, and um, it was nice experience. So I think yes, it. it it adds to the meaning uh, the uh, indian Me medical association having him as a chairman in uh, conducting this uh, wonderful workshop uh, special thanks to you and uh, dr madhusudana president and shrinivas for organizing this and conducting this and also i thank dr chirag uh, for sharing uh, some of the slides what i what i'm going to share today so i think chirag has uh, already spoken about the general considerations of a sports injury um so how do we prevent these injuries i think it's 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 uh, it's the same points whether it's a shoulder or ankle or a knee or any any joint any any limb injury i think that these points i have uh, uh, distilled from many of the uh, uh, materials what i go, went through so they need to be in a proper physical condition to play the sports very very important their their physical uh, strength and conditioning it should be at the optimum level and uh, they should abide with the rules of the game whatever they are into whether it is running whether it is uh, badminton or whatever it is and they they need to wear a appropriate protective gears and equipments it's very very important if the cricketing uh, uh, you know the bowler or a batsman or a wicket keeper if they don't wear the appropriate gear they are obviously susceptible for uh, grievous injuries and whenever they have some injuries it's very important to respect the nature nature always heals and this is one aspect nowadays sports persons are not able to do because of a lot of pressure as chirak shared it i think rest is very important in healing we all have to understand the the rest gives natural healing so ultimately we are nobody uh, i mean in front of the nature because nature heals most of the injuries and they the every sports fan needs to have a proper warm up before they start playing we we all talk about warm up whether it is a uh, any kind of exercise routinely also for example if you are into yoga or if you are into gymming or if you are running or anything i think initial warm up is most important where you are pumping your blood into a muscle properly and then you are recovering in a good way so that there is a good oxygen supply to the cells and uh, even the muscles and the joints are conditioned before uh, it is you know whatever appropriate action it has to do and uh, whenever there is a tiredness or there is a pain i think one has to stop it should, they should not you know push themselves against the pain it's the most important thing so injuries are inevitable nobody can say that they can never have injuries and i don't think so it's a proper advice to tell them that never play to avoid injuries i think it's a bad advice so injuries are inevitable if they play and only thing they have to take certain precautions which i mentioned it and i will be discussing about the lower limb injuries chirag has touched nicely on upper limb injuries which are more common and uh, having understood the the audience type in this forum i think uh, the most of them are uh, non orthopedic surgeons and even uh, basic orthopedics they may be doing uh, so i will be in uh, very brief about i am not going to show any of the surgical uh, aspects i will be just mentioning about what are the injuries and how do we manage and how do we prevent this should be my motto so if you understand the lower limb injuries lower limb is a relatively compared to the upper limb is a massively built limb and uh, obviously it has got a lot of muscles and the main function for the lower limb is the locomotion movement and uh, there is a body weight on the lower limb and there is also the ground reaction force which influences any kind of uh, injuries in lower limbs so let me start with the hip joint i think we all know that i think many of you have heard about the hip injuries and ankle injuries but uh, uh, knee knee and ankle injuries sorry and hip is equally important but nowadays we get lot of hip injuries and uh, if they are not properly managed and neglected they can even lead to a bad arthritis in future in fact now it is a, a sub speciality which is evolving as the hip preservation you know where these injuries are identified early and uh, properly addressed so i'm just going to mention you some of the conditions there are more than 30 conditions which which can affect the hip in a sports person so here the most common ones are the muscle strains 
we commonly see what is what is called as a groin strain if you all understand there is a muscle group in the adductor region or in the groin so there there is a iliopsoas muscle so these muscles can get strained especially in a runner or a footballer or a soccer player uh, where there there the contact sports is uh, involving lot of movements and muscle uh, functions they can pull or they can strain there are nothing but the, the muscle strain uh, of the groin muscles and there can be hip bursitis constantly irritated hip there are so many bursas around the hip joints if you understand gluteus medius muscle which is originates from the iliac bone which is inserted into the greater trochanter and gluteus medius and there is iliopsoas so there is ischium there is a lot of bursas where the bursas are nothing but the cushions which are provided between the muscle insertion and the bone and they can get irritated or they can if they are constantly irritated they can give pain so these are uh, some of the aspects in the bursa and then there can be contusions if there, there is a player who is a soccer player and suddenly there is a lateral thrust from the side a, a, a very strong person uh, who is hitting the hip there can be contusions inside the bone contusions are nothing but bleeding inside the bone there won't be any obvious fracture x rays will be negative and they also need treatment and identification there can be stress fractures stress fractures are nothing but constantly a bone which is put into a uh, pressure or a stress constantly something like a runners who are who are not runners of 2 km 5 km what i am talking is a marathon runners who, who, who runs for 40 80 km non stop so they can have a, a stress fracture a simple stress fracture is nothing but there is a, a, a subtle amount of breakdown in the cortex of the bone and then there is a, also a healing which leads to lot of sclerosis so that is called a stress fracture stress fractures can be seen around the hip joints especially in the femoral neck and even in the femur shaft so these are the some of the uh, stress fractures there can be hip labral tears if you understand the acetabulum when the hip joint is articulating between the socket that is acetabulum and the ball which is the femoral head so the socket is also lined by a labrum a connective tissue which is very tough and it, it it deepens the hip joint there can be tears in the labrum so these labral tears can be quite troublesome and these are the ones which can cause impingement and chronic arthritis of the hip joint so this this can be quite disabling to the extent that the sports person can may have to stop playing so these are some of the uh, problems around the hip joints and then osteitis pubis it is nothing but the inflammation around the si joints and the pubic bones so they they can also have a quite a trouble something there is a condition called snapping hip syndrome snapping hip syndrome because if you understand the anatomy of the hip joint hip joint is nothing but the joint which is surrounded by tendons and bones every joint is the same so in around the hip joint there is a structure called iliotibial band a tensor fascia lata which is in the proximal region iliotibial band is in the distal region so the same structure around the hip can cause irritation onto the trochanter and hip and can cause uh, troublesome so this is the same thing which i was telling you this is the iliac uh, iliotibial band which is extending from the iliac crest this is nothing but a deep and fascia very deep fascia which is very thick connective tissue running from all around from the hip to the knee joint so this this can be a troublesome so this is this is a sports injury which can come around the knee so some of the conditions what i discussed were around the hip joints there are so many things and that itself will be a big topic and i am not going to discuss more in detail about the hip problems here i will be jumping to the knee now so here we have what is this called as iliotibial band syndrome so this is quite common in the sports where there is a frequent flexion extension something like a, a bicycling or even a runners and uh, 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 the games like football where they are frequently flexing and in ex extending against the force of the ground and then the muscles they can have irritations many people suffer and this requires a simple treatment so how do we how, how do we identify them they they always come in the pain on the lateral aspect of the distal thigh and it's quite a bad pain especially when when they they when they run when they run are put into action whatever their sports they are in the pain exaggerates and uh, and most severely when he is bent it to 30 to 45 degree flexion so this is common situation in a runner 
uh, who runs for a long distance. So constantly when they run, because of the thickened tissue and constantly when one who is putting the muscle into continuous uh, contraction, there will be some kind of tightness. So most of these uh, sports injuries around the lower limb is because of the tight muscles. So the stretching part, which is quite often ignored by the sports person. So this is one thing which leads to uh, kind of problems. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Audible. Yeah. So, so we, we basically do the testing by local uh, tenderness and then uh, certain tests like Ober's test where we identify the problem and then put them into simple things like what uh, Chirag mentioned, the same thing like rest. Rest is the most important for any sports injury, even here also. Rest need not be rest for a very long duration. It may be simple like three, four days of rest or a couple of weeks also sometimes in extreme cases. And then always the ice, local ice is one important uh, treatment modality what is used in acute injuries. In the chronic injuries, they may not be of uh, so much of uh, help. For acute injuries, certainly ice, cooling the local area with uh, which re reduces the inflammation and uh, anti-inflammatory medications are used, you know, if there are indications. Very rarely, they are injected with local uh, anti-inflammatory medications like steroids. So we generally avoid, but local injections can be offered when there is a resistant problem. Stretching is very important. So if there are a certain way of stretching the iliotibial band. So those of you who are into running, I think I'm sure there are so many people like Malve Gauda, so who are into running and sports. So you can do stretching like this. You can see that how he is stretching the left leg, left iliotibial band by stabilizing the right knee onto the opposite side and the left knee on the opposite side and the whole body is turned towards the opposite side. And there are many ways and uh, probably you can discuss with the physiotherapist. They will teach you how to stretch the iliotibial band. So next I'll be going into the uh, brief about the knee problems. What are the other uh, problems? If before that, I would like to remind you about the anatomy. You all know that there are the knee is made up of the distal femur, proximal tibia, fibula, and there are so many structures which are stabilizing this joint. This is a very, very important joint, especially for a sports person because this is a very frequently injured joint because it's a hinge joint. And most of the activities with the load is taken on the knee first. Maximum load takes. So in fact, the, the ligament, the knee is supported by a lot of complementary ligament system. So we have from the front, we have quadriceps tendon, the tendon, which is formed by the quadriceps rectus femoris, and it is joined with the vastus medialis, vastus lateralis, and the same tendon, and then it's the patella. There can be problems in the distal uh, quadriceps tendon. There can be problems in the patella tendon. The patella tendon, you all know that it is extending from the patella to the tibial tubercle. And then we have the collateral ligaments on the sides, like laterally, we have lateral collateral ligament, we have anterior uh, lateral ligament, and then we have medial collateral ligament. And then we have cruciate ligaments in the center. And then also the knee is supported by the meniscus. And I'll be detailed in, I know I'll be discussing briefly about this meniscus also. See, if you look at the anatomical specimen, this is how the meniscus looks. I think most of you have studied, but uh, uh, this is just a reminder. The meniscus is, there are two meniscus, one is the medial meniscus and the lateral meniscus. They support, and relatively, the lateral meniscus is more mobile. So medial meniscus is less mobile. So, and also if you look at the anatomy, there are some certain subtle differences between the medial and the lateral meniscus. More in a rounded shape, this is more in a C shape. And uh, because of their anatomical uh, certainties, uh, one is more prone for injuries. In acute injuries, it is a lateral because there's a lot of force which is on the knee. In a chronic injury, the medial meniscus takes the bond. Right. So that's about the meniscus and meniscus can tear. So how do the meniscus tears can present? They, they always present with a history of pain and sometimes even a locking. Locking, some of you have heard about the bucket handle tears of the meniscus, where the, the whole, uh, the meniscus posterior to anterior to a certain extent, they can tear and the whole substance get displaced into the intercondylar region and they can present like a locked knee. So locked knee is quite uh, troublesome to the person who is suffering and they won't be able to straighten the knee and sometimes some orthopedic surgeons try to reduce it so that they can buy time till they decide for any kind of alternative management. And all these physical tears, 
most of the time are diagnosed by clinical examination and history important and then of course nowadays with mri scan mri is quite sensitive and uh, we do what is called as a meniscal repair so meniscus is one structure we always have to try to preserve it because it's very important because it's a shock absorber and also it takes a lot of stress in the knee equalizes the stress so hence it prevents early arthritis so without a meniscus how arthritis can happen you can if you look at this year the meniscectomy this the meniscus was removed because of some uh, whatever pathology and there you can see that the wear and tear of the cartilage is exposed so there can be arthritis so next is the common is the ligament injury i think uh, sports injury specialist will be dealing most of the time is the life around these two ligaments especially the one ligament which is the anterior cruciate ligament uh, i'm sure many of you would have had or heard from uh, your own circles this is a quite a troublesome ligament so we we managed based on a lot of uh, uh, points so as i was mentioning there are so many ligaments around the knee joint so this is the cruciate ligament the important ligament is the anterior cruciate ligament which runs from anterior to the posterior and posteriorly it is attached to the lateral condyle of the femur and there are two bundles of the ligament and similarly the posterior cruciate ligament comes from posterior so they are criss cross you know because of the cruciate nature they are called cruciate and they give a rotational stability to the knee joint if they are torn rotationally they are the knee will be unstable where a person can experience buckling of the knee or giving way of the knee or unstable so quite often they are symptomatic especially in a active young adult they are very symptomatic and uh, the the management of these injuries based on lot of factors one of the important factors is the age and the type of the sports or activity they are into for example if the 50 year old person or a doctor who is a recreational a sports person who tears his acl need not go for surgery if he can alter his sports activity and if he can strengthen his knee probably we can manage conservatively the same thing is not applicable to a person who is around 20 year old who is actively into sports and uh, who is into contact sports especially like a football or anything that is certainly need to stabilize their knee with the surgery so the ligament surgery i mean the ligament treatment is conservative or surgical based on many factors so this is quite a common situation for a sports person but in our country in our practice commonly we see road traffic accident is one of the reason for these ligament injuries if it is a sports person it is it is a disabling thing in fact it is it's going to affect their career also so serious decisions have to be taken and discussed with the family and the sports person uh, i'm sure many of you know that many of our indian players had uh, anterior cruciate ligament tear and surgery and then went back to play also so road traffic accident as i mentioned is another thing and fall at home is another factor where in acl can be torn so we don't have to think that just i had a fall at home and acl can never tear as i said this is a injury which happens on a fixed leg and the body is in motion where the femur rotates and then the ligament can tear there can be a partial tear or a complete tear they are based on the mri scan but uh, in terms of uh, conservatively management it's always the rehabilitation and bracing which takes the uh, precedence but if you have to i mean if there is no response to the conservative treatment or especially as i said if it is a demanding person like a sports person or a young adult probably it's worthwhile going for a surgical reconstruction where we're going to reconstruct the so that's why there is a difference between repair and reconstruction repair is the one where we suture the ligament which is torn because if you understand inside the joint nothing heals because joint is a vascular the joint nutrition is taken by the synovial fluid which is not good enough to repair the torn tissues that's why whether it is a meniscus or a ligament they need to be addressed surgically and uh, whatever said and done they can never be replaced so that's why all the care should be taken and we all say that reconstruction but i don't think so any any surgeon can completely reconstruct this lost ligament so because the the native original anterior cruciate or any kind of a ligaments they have certain properties which cannot be completely replaced but certainly mechanically if they are unstable they can give them a stable knee so this is the recon this is just a picture to show you how the ligament is reconstructed here both posterior cruciate ligament and anterior cruciate ligaments are reconstructed 
the reconstruction is done using some of the tissues as donors like uh, some of the structures which are very popular nowadays is a hamstring tendon in the hamstring tendon if you remember there, there is a pes anserina at the knee which is inserted in the anterior medial aspect of the tibia which is a, a semi tendinosus and vessel these are the popular two ligaments which are commonly used and the patella tendon is another popular uh, tendon which we use there are so many tendons there are allo grafts which are taken from the cadavers so that goes on anyway the initial management will be uh, uh, rest and bracing and icing whatever uh, chirag mentioned rice therapy which is applicable same here also so we we need to put them in a compression elevation icing and stretches as possible as soon as possible we have to start the knee movements we don't completely immobilize these injured knee joints for the fear that the knee can go into stiffness very fast so as i discussed with can we manage these ligament injuries completely conservative as i said yes definitely depends on the age of the patient type of the sports rehabilitation how they do it bracing how they follow it there are wonderful braces available where but certainly no bracing is superior than the internal brace which is replaced by the surgery by the ligament reconstruction so of course the rehabilitation is the most important uh, aspect in any kind of a ligament injury because they have to manage by proper strengthening uh, of the the muscles muscles relatively can compensate for the lost ligament inside the knee but certainly have to completely replace them and uh, core strengthening this is a very very important topic i always stress to my patients that it is not important to strengthen just the injured limb down a whole they need to strengthen the core body you have to imagine that the body as a whole acts in a sports it's not only that area and in fact a strong core can prevent injuries on the peripheral limbs that, that's what i keep telling my patients so that's about the ligament injury whether it's a, a cruciate anterior or posterior the same rule is applicable i'll be mentioning some of the conditions which where the uh, sports person can be affected patella tendinitis is another common thing so it's nothing but inflammation in the substance of the patella tendon so there are uh, so many terminologies used is called jumpers knee because it's commonly seen in a jumping activity so they can have again a, a, a movement which is having frequently flexion and extension against the body force and body weight and ground reaction force they can have injuries so jumpers knee can happen in this area the whole thing can be inflamed most of the time they they are managed conservatively most of these uh, this uh, ligament tendinitis um, inflammation in the tendon mid substance managed conservatively so how do you manage you manage them again the same principles rest elevation compression and then sometimes we do physiotherapy also ultrasonic massage is a good modality where it reduces the local inflammation and uh, modalities like uh, local application of ice and then of course once the inflammation is reduced we follow with the good treatment of stretching and strengthening exercises so most important then we have quadriceps tendinitis as i mentioned in the anatomical section this is a quadriceps tendon that also can go into inflammation this again is managed in the same principles it's a managed with the rest anti inflammatory medication and there are so many supports which are available nowadays there are what is called as a k taping the tapings are available where in acute scenario these tapes can be applied and i don't know some of you must have seen in tennis and uh, shuttlecock uh, you know badminton where they wear these play uh, tapes and play play the game and finish so that they reduce the stress on the affected pathological area and there are braces but whatever said and done these braces i really don't like because they 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 inhibit the muscle function and they can cause muscle wasting so it's important to stretch this is how a quadriceps muscle is stretched you fix it and in a extended hip joint you flex the knee and then you extend the hip joint so that's how we can stretch stretching is very very important and then the strengthening of the quadriceps these are some of the way we manage this uh, tendinitis inflammation around the knee another common condition what we see in the chondromalacia patella again we see middle aged people 30 to 40 40 to 50 who are playing shuttle badminton for a recreational purpose every day suddenly has a catching type of severe pain in the knee they can have is what is called as a patella femoral pain syndromes because there are so many pathologies and so many reasons and why they get get affected some of them they can have 
small tracking this is there is a severe inflammation between the patella and the the femoral condyle and they are quite troublesome there can be tight uh, muscle structures again they are managed conservatively there can be mal alignment problems like varus of the knee joint the valgus of the knee joint where the stress on the patellar articular surface is completely altered they can suffer and which leads to a different angulation at the even the ankle joint as well signs and symptoms the same thing they have pain in the front of the knee and some people uh, quite often they complain that there is a grinding noise a crepitus or a crackling noise from the knee joint i i, I don't think so crackling noise per se is a problem it can be ignored but crackling noise along with the pain is one thing which has to be addressed again the treatment will be proper stretching of the muscles and a good strengthening of the knee and the, the we have to understand that even the a poor a foot problem can lead to knee problem and a bad knee problem can lead to foot problem they are all complementary so as i said we need to examine them from hip to toe and then address if there is any mal alignment problems so there is a problem it is not enough that we attend to the problem we have to attend to the cause how it came to that also so vastus medial is oblique strengthening exercise is important exercise some of the picture just to show you how on a stepper they can strengthen just as squats and stretching hamstring stretches and hip abductor strengthening as i said all these problems should be strengthened by the core body muscles there is any foot and ankle problem needs to be addressed again as i said the taping is very important again it's useful in the anterior pain syndrome some of the braces are available for a chronic disabling pain who wants who are, wants to play and who are into professional sports they can have these braces and play so special specific population at risk for these uh, anterior knee pain is the runners and bicyclists the cyclists to again cycle for a very long time because again the cycling is one thing it's very much important to address the ergonomics ergonomics means the length of the leg to the saddle the way they are sitting so all these things have to be taken into consideration if they are flexing the knee too much when they are cycling again they will be loading their patella too much so so these the, the, these are the things which have to be considered in that tennis so all these things are sport specific you know whatever sports they are into we have to look into that sports what's happening there and then we treat them accordingly it's a huge topic and it's a huge specialty itself now uh, of ergonomics and uh, there are special people who does the uh, gait analysis cycle analysis and then they advise what they have to change whether they have to change the seating they whether they have to lengthen the seat uh, how they have to sit everything is now there is a science another injury which can happen in a sports person the cartilage injury cartilage is nothing but the hyaline cartilage which is lining the distal femur and proximal tibia they can have focal defects of the cartilage again the cartilage loss is a loss forever and this can be addressed by various means now and neglected they can lead to osteoarthritis i will not be going into the details of the management because it's again a big topic and muscle strain is the next common thing which can where a sports person especially a runner can experience so muscle strain can be as mild as a simple microscopic uh, disruption of the fibers to a massive tear of the muscle so the tear will require a surgery uh, a minor thing requires a rest and then the same therapy like inflammatory medications and stretching exercises so again why do these muscle tears happen i must share it here some of the youngsters are into this now bodybuilding and also quick results they are into this anabolic steroid pumping so this steroids uh, taking no doubt builds the muscle but the functional element of the muscle are very friable and they can spontaneously rupture i am sure many of our colleagues have experienced this spontaneous ruptures of the muscles while in uh, in gymnasium uh, during the workout itself they are very dangerous and they they should be discouraged so they can uh, come with a sudden sharp pain and they are not able to do any kind of activity they are following a uh, swelling bruising again the treatment will be rest ice compression elevate taping and then gradual stretching and strengthening exercises another common problem which we see in uh, runners like malwega gowda we can see as shin splints where there is a periostitis because of the constant uh, stress on the proximal in the middle third of the tibia they can have continuous inflammation at the posterior tibial uh, muscle region uh, so they they quite uh, troublesome they start running once they run the pain disappears and in the initial phase of the run the, the pain uh, becomes very severe 
The same people can have even chronic uh, leg syndrome as well, where the compartment uh, pressure is very high in the muscles. And all these people are addressed with the simple stretches, rest, and then they are back on the track. They don't have to be stopping this. And if there are any issues with the foot and uh, foot arches, need to be corrected. So the treatment will be same thing: anti-inflammatory medication, proper footwear. If there is a pronated foot or a supinated foot, they need to have, take an opinion or advice by the uh, podiatrist or a person who can give a proper shoes. So as I said, the same thing. Uh, next injury is the stress fracture. Uh, stress fracture can be there in the shin of the, I mean, the same thing area, the tibial shaft to the uh, metatarsals, metatarsals, anywhere else in the metatarsals. Again, they are managed with rest, eyes, and you know some kind of a support like a crepe bandage and uh, compressor devices, and they can go back to that. Uh, actually, tendon, the, the gastrocnemius is another muscle which is repeated injuries. It can go into a simple like an inflammation of the tendon, what called tendinitis to a spontaneous rupture of the tendon as, as well. So the tendinitis again is man, managed by simple things. Uh, but now one must, uh, one, one uh, important part, uh, recent advances I must share is the PRP injections. Now PRP, uh, the platelet rich plasma is everywhere, starting from dermatology to orthopedics to every speciality. Uh, I don't know how much they help, but certainly in certain conditions we can use them. But I personally use them in a limited way. Uh, but we use it. The other other things like stretching, strengthening, those things are most important than these uh, invasive procedures. There are some supplements are also available. We can use them to just to strengthen. Uh, we have to understand that most important is the exercise. The body which is strong, it is definitely less for uh, any kind of injuries. That's that's the message I want to give. Retrocalcaneal bursitis or a spur is another injury where as you know, an athlete can experience and plantar fasciitis. This is the commonest problem in the uh, middle-aged women or who are into uh, sports like uh, uh, shuttle badminton, uh, basketball, where they frequently land on the toes where there can be stress, especially again, this is because of the tight gastrocnemius muscle, gastrosolial complex. So simple stretching the gastrosolial complex can relieve the pain here. Again, they are managed by different footwears and proper stretching exercises and rarely uh, injection into the tender spot. So it, in, in X-ray, they are depicted as a heel spur. So to conclude my talk, I would like to give the, the message here is you need to strengthen the body. With whatever it is, if it is a if it is a sports which is into a shoulder demanding activity, they need to have a very strong shoulder like swimming and uh, shuttle badminton, uh, badminton, whatever. And if they're into a contact sports like a badminton or a football, they need to have a strong knee joints. They need to have good hip joints. So they need to strengthen the muscles there. And stretching is very, very important. A muscle which is very tight can rupture very fast. Nutrition is important. Protein or a good balanced diet, what is they need to con consume. And any injury happen, they need to rest. Very importantly, and conditioning and training is equally important. So ultimate message is, I began with uh, saying that, you know, uh, and I'll be ending that. So play anyway, injuries can be managed. Thank you so much for uh, Medical yeah. Association of India and then uh, all of you. Thank you very much, sir. It's a, again, an extensive talk. Hello. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm with you. Yeah. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. It's uh, again an extensive talk. Actually, both the speakers listed few uh, basic steps to be followed to prevent the sports injuries. So I would like to add a few more uh, measures to be taken. So always, whatever the sports, there has to be a graded training. So that is to build endurance and our stamina. So unless you have a graded training, all of a sudden you get into the Hectic training, you will uh, most of the time end, end up in having a sports <coughs> injury. And always, Madhu, can I? Am I audible? Madhu? Yeah, yeah. We are very much with you. Yeah. So actually, graded training is one of the best things to be followed to build the endurance and stamina. Then only we can get into the hectic schedule and other thing. And always, we should listen to the body. That is the best guide. So whenever we, we find there is a pain or something, so we should stop there. Then again, we have to continue. So that is one thing. 
and the second thing is like uh, like what we say there is a warming up there is also a cooling down cooling down also is there in a sports so whatever the sports at the end of the sports activity we have to cool down the body properly after any uh, strenuous exercise so what they say is cooling down period is almost twice the warming up period so that is also one of the thing to be followed and hydration is the one of the most important thing in any sports hydration lot of hydration so we need to hydrate the body thoroughly then the following the right technique and uh, it is uh, mentioned by both the speakers and always encourage the cross training cross training means the one who is doing uh, cycling as a profession has to get into to build the stamina or endurance to get into some contact sports like basketball or some other sport that is also one of the good idea then uh, as uh, dr rudrapasad mentioned it's a healthy ba- well balanced diet is also important uh, then uh, as in acute say, acute case we say ice now so likewise in chronic hot fermentation is also definitely helpful that is one thing and uh, as dr rudrapasad said it band syndrome it's very common in cyclists that is again there is a continuous flexion and extension so that is most of the time the reason for that is the saddle height so we need to bring it down and we have to adjust uh, to 15 degree flexion at the uh, knee joint so that solves the most of the problem most of the time it band syndrome then ultimately it's the mental makeup is also very important to get into any active and uh, to pursue any active sports like uh, andy murray he is playing tennis even today after thr that's great so ultimately mental makeup is also one of the thing to be considered so these are the few things i, w- I would like to add and uh, sir for the both the speakers whoever you can answer i i have a few questions for on behalf of uh, all sports person so everyone is aware of rice so in the rice or i e is known but compression not many people knowing about this can you, one of you can uh elaborate what is exactly compression how it is done yeah um compression cannot be given in certain joints like shoulder okay so simply the joints like knee ankle and uh, wrist uh, elbow also you can have compression because the compression is basically uh uniform pressure on the circumference of the limb which is going to reduce the uh, the 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 uh, inflammation or the edema which is happening because of the bleeding inside the tissues so especially in the initial phase of injury the compression really helps and uh, the compression is different thing from the real support or real bracing of the limb so compression should be done only for initial few hours so that the bleeding or the injury further injury can be avoided uh, the best example would be knee joint whenever there is a knee swells up if you give a immediate uh, icing around the knee which reduces the dilated vessels diameter and uh, obviously the reactive inflammation reduces and then follow a good compression also support the limb because always in a limb injured there is inhibition of the surrounding uh, muscles for example in the knee there is a reflex inhibition perceps muscle so they may not be able to even stand or walk so if the compression is given properly they, they it even acts like a support thing okay sir uh, like what is the best advice like whenever there is a on a scenario like where, when they are playing all of a sudden they will have hamstring strain or got some strain so what do you advise on the on that uh, scenario yeah there is uh, muscle strains are uh, quite uh, bothersome uh, so in the field there won't be any orthopedic surgeon many a times so what yeah. they have in the field is the physios physiotherapists uh, they are quite uh, knowledgeable to identify uh, and differentiate between a muscle tear to a simple strain most of the time so this violent contraction of the muscle which can lead to some microscopic giving way of the fibers they can be managed initially if if, he, if the physio can identify that this is a simple strain it is not a tear which requires hospitalization to be seen by a surgeon or needs a surgeon so basically what they do is locally they give a 
lot of ice packs and if the muscle function can be assessed back if there is a good muscle function they can be give uh, they can be given rest for some time and if it is a simple strain they can do some stretches and then they can come back to the the game so if there is a massive tear they need to be shifted or informed to the particular uh, way of management where the muscle tissues are identified by a portable ultrasound scan also if they have a specialty available they can do a ultrasound scan a simple investigation which can tell what kind of a spasm what kind of a injury it is it is a hematoma what is the grade of the injury then they can take a proper action so certainly it has to be initially seen by a physio and to be differentiated between the grading of the injury no, sir, what, exactly, what exactly you do when someone is playing and there are no physiotherapists there are no any doctors or some uh, any anyone who is trained so what is what do you advise uh, strengthening means uh, what is there so immediately no, when there there won't be any there won't be any strengthening immediately they have to yeah. give rest most important is the rest they have to retire from game for time being transiently for that moment and okay. then they okay. have to the local ice packs and then okay. they have to see if they can no, stretch the some time if they can stretch if there is a excruciating pain that means there is a injury quite bad okay. and stop doing that and then report to the hospital or doctor immediately if they can stretch and the pain is relatively tolerable and then they can give rest for some time they can go back to play but if it is a strain uh, which is between the tear and a very minor tear i think it's always the rest we we always recommend them to retire from that particular game at that moment we don't recommend them to continue game you know yes sir sir you mentioned about taping so is it the same as like kinesiology tape available in the market yeah it's the same thing but the taping should not be done by a self it is always uh, you know advise, advisable to take a suggestion by the physiotherapist who has knowledge about because these tapings are done with the direction of the muscle forces if they are not okay. properly applied, they can they can act uh, wrong if, for example if there is an anterior syndrome of the knee if the kinesiology or yeah. tape is not applied properly it can create more pressure on the patella and they can have more more injury yeah exactly sir uh, what anatomical factors you will uh, you will consider they are more prone to develop sports injuries yeah if there is a gross valgus of the knee joint knee valgus gross valgus knee joint okay and the foot will be very flat Bonus. again uh, Uh, they should not think that you know flat foot is bad flat foot is uh, you know uh, around 20% of the population is normal uh, you know having a flat foot that's quite that's normal yeah. uh, flat foot what we call to the extent that there is a valgus of the heel to the extent there is a impingement on the the sinus tarsi so those are the ones especially gross uh, valgus of the foot deformity gross valgus or varus deformity of the knee joint they can be prone for valgus knees are more prone for uh, anterior cruciate ligament tears so varus okay. knees prone for medial meniscal injuries uh, lateral collateral ligament uh, strains or tears posterior lateral corner injuries so the limb alignment is important okay sir sir among uh, prp or steroids what do you prefer uh steroids or what chirag you want to answer for that or you want me to answer yeah anything so uh, it's it's totally a different uh, uh, treatment yeah, whatever one of the, one of your slides showed the prp you know injection yeah yeah so so uh, see both of them are totally different treatment modal modality now okay. you need to understand prp is to control inflammation i mean sorry uh, steroid is to control inflammation and prp is to enhance healing okay mm. so now we call a prp we do not use the term prp it is a uh, it's a it's a He, uh, it's a uh, growth enhancer. We have we have started call, calling it as ortho biologics, like which enhance okay. healing. Whereas uh, whereas uh, uh, cortisone is basically to control inflammation and to reduce the pain. So okay. any form of gross tendinitis may be a, uh, which is painful, and the movements are restricted. Never go in for a PRP injection at that. that time only when the inflammation subsides either, either with the oral uh, corticosteroids or with oral anti-inflammatories ice rest 
once the patient gains a little bit of functionality, then only go in for a, a PRP injection. Yeah. Some people do mix PRP with the uh, cortisone and, and uh, give a shot, but I'm not really a proponent of that. Uh, I don't know. What's your take, uh, Rudra, sir? No, sir, as you mentioned, I think a steroid is used in a, uh, very uh, painful conditions. Right, the best example, the steroid commonly used is a plantar fascia and the tennis elbow. These are the common uh, you know, injected areas. Uh, but having said that, we don't know whether the steroid, steroid definitely reduces the inflammation, but ultimately there is a way of giving a steroid injection. Many a times we make a multiple puncture into the tendon, which enhances a good vasculature and then healing. So, but certain people we have seen that, you know, they are not able to even hold a glass of water or they are not able to hold a tub. Their day-to-day their, their -day life is really badly affected. So when, when the day-to-day -day life is very badly affected, those are the situations we select them for a steroid injection. Otherwise, definitely we know. And I always, again, as I said repeatedly, a good stretching exercise for the, uh, the, the common extents or muscles of the elbow and then strengthening exercise with the rotation and then you know, the pronation and supination. Most of the time, they, they reduce the pain, but they take, take time. And uh, always the conservative treatment is good for these things. And regarding the PRP injection, again, I'm not a big fan of PRP. I still have a doubt of my own because it has been more of a hypothetical injection than uh, really whether it is really helping or not. We don't know. It's quite expensive and we all are uh, told by the signs and everything that PRP injections are good in different uh, fields. But uh, I, we are not doing only PRP and forgetting that we are also doing other treatments and then you know there is a healing so but certainly it's a biology biology when we are, we are talking probably there is something so in certain situations only I use PRP but otherwise regularly I don't use PRP I think okay. sir, let me just add on a, a simple point here so yeah. most of the patients whom we give a cortisone shot for it made before a tennis elbow or a plantar fasciitis so first, okay. when the patient presents to us, we put them on anti-inflammatories, tell them to stretch it out. Okay. Ask them to stretch it out and rest it, which the patients do not, invariably they do not do it. I think if they follow the instructions clearly, <laughs> avoid movement, do stretches, I think uh, we can avoid PR, uh, uh, cortisone injections in most of the, these patients. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Dr. Uh, Dr. there is a question. Somebody yes, has asked a question about uh, can cartilage uh, full tear heal uh, created by a fall during tennis uh, naturally with rest and medicine? What can uh, what care has to be given? But they have not mentioned about uh, cartilage tear where whether it is in the shoulder or the knee. Somebody probably in the knee. Dr. Probably Navi, in the knee. Probably in the knee. So yes, if the Cartilage is a terminology we use it for various things. You know, if there is a meniscus also, it is also termed as a cartilage by many people. But the cartilage per se in our uh, language is the cartilage, which is the hyaline cartilage, which is articulating. If there is a defect, they mentioned that 8.5 millimeter. 8.5 millimeter is a huge lesion, according to me. It's a very, very big lesion. Very huge lesion. And if, if the cartilage, which is not separated from the, the articular surface, then probably rest and uh, some kind of a conservative management might do. But if it is already separated, if it is only a pure cartilage, it's difficult to you know put it back even surgically also. If it is associated with some kind of a bone stock with the cartilage, probably it's now it's worthwhile going and taking and fixing it. Otherwise, there are various modalities of treatment now. Uh, what is called as a autologous chondrocyte implantation and then mosaic plasty. There is a mosaic different uh, technique. Cartilage uh, defects can be managed. Yes, sir. Shall we move on to the questions? Like, shall we take question on questions? Yeah, yeah, sure, sir. Madhu? Hello? Madhu, can you hear us? Yeah, yeah, I can. I'm very much. So, yeah, there is one more question. Sir, in normal ankle strain, no, it disappeared. <laughs> yeah, so, can you see that? Yeah, yeah I, I can see. see, I can see. How many days rest to re restart playing the sports and what is the protocol to treat for a normal ankle sprain? It's a good question because it's a common injury, uh, not only for a sports person, even for a day-to-day -day life uh, people also. 
So uh, uh, ankle sprain is uh, the sprain is nothing but a ligament injury. Strain is to the muscle, strain is to the ligament. So whenever we are talking about the ankle, generally we are talking about the lateral ankle ligaments, so which is caused by inversion injuries. And uh, lateral anterior talofibular or calcaneofibular ligaments are the common ligaments which gets injured. Um, so these injuries, again, we grade them at three grades, mild, moderate, and severe for a simple understanding. And uh, mild to moderate probably can be managed uh, relatively simple way, like uh, a crepe bandage or a, a figure of eight uh, support around the ankle. And then again, uh, in between eyes, elevation, compression, all these things. But these uh, supports are given for three weeks generally. And then another three weeks, what I do is another three weeks, I give them a, a restricted activity. Restricted activity, another six weeks, which is also associated with the good strain, I tell them before they start the games or the sports for a mild to moderate. If it is a severe, where there is a complete rupture of the ligament, I, I generally advise them a strict immobilization in a plaster cast preferably, or there are so many advanced uh, uh, immobilization devices are available, which allow some kind of a flexibility and freedom. And then followed by a minimum, again, three weeks of immobilization, another three weeks of physiotherapy and complete tear. I don't allow them till three months. This is my protocol. You don't treat uh, complete tear surgically, sir? No, see, these uh, ankle ligaments are all extra articular ligaments. They are not intra articular. So they are quite richly supplied by vasculature, blood supply, and they all heal most of the time. Unless they become very unstable in a chronic situation where frequently they are injuring, they have not taken a treatment in the beginning properly, uh, proper immobilization was not given, which is common scenario in our country because we say three weeks. After uh, first week, they feel comfortable, they throw away everything and they start walking and the ankle can become muscular. In those situations, if they go for a chronic instability, then we have various procedures to stabilize the ankle. Sir, Dr. Prashad Reddy is thanking you, sir, for the nice information. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, do you advise the anklet with brace for uh, this thing? As you said, figure of eight, no? Instead of that, anklet with brace will do. What I do is uh, for first three weeks, it's a crepe bandage with the ankle binder. I first okay. apply the crepe bandage because uniformly it compresses in the weight and then the ankle band is applied over that. And then okay. uh, for the next three weeks, for any kind of a uneven surface walking demand activity, I ask them to wear the figure of eight anklet, ankle binder. I don't advise them crepe bandage after three weeks. This is my protocol. Chira, you manage them differently? It depends on, uh, is it an acute injury or a chronic injury? Of course, any ankle injury, uh, like the ATFL injury, what uh, Rudra sir was talking about, uh, acutely, I don't think there's a role of uh, me repairing them because most of this, 90% of them do heal either to the bone or they, uh, even the mid-substance tears do get scarred and heal. The good physical therapy most, uh, with the, in the recovery phase, most of them get good amount of stability. Because these, these recurrent uh, uh, ankle uh, instability patients, where the opening of the ankle is much more than the other side, a grade three opening, and the patient, or else the patient who has got a concomitant injury, like the like uh, uh, cartilages in this lesion in the talus because of repeated twisting injuries, these are the candidates which require a ATFL reconstruction or a uh, or an augmentation. So ninety to ninety five percent of the ankle injuries, I think, can be conserved with a good immobilization, if it's a grade two plus, I always cast them for the first three weeks. There's no second thing about air cast and all those things. I just put a cast, grade two plus. A grade one, milder form of grade two, of course, walking boots are available nowadays. A pneumatic uh, splints are available nowadays. Three weeks of immobilization in either form is, is I think, the prime importance in any ankle injuries. Of course, with the RICE protocol, Following that, we put them on a gradual rehab program. Of course, ankle brace, as uh, Dr. Rudra Prasad said, ankle brace is a wonderful device which gives a side-to-side -side stability and it doesn't constrain the ankle much. It doesn't restrict much of a movement, but at the same time, it provides an adequate support. 
I think in about three months is when we look at the return to sports conservatively in these ankle injuries. You mean to say you treat osteochondral injuries surgically? Yeah, 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 very much, very much. Osteochondral okay. injuries of the talus needs to be addressed surgically, most of yeah. them. Sir, I uh, in, in grade one, grade two, do you advise to walk them? Uh, do to advise walk with the ankle with brace from day one or what? No. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we certainly grade one injuries, grade two injuries, even grade three also. You know, we don't make. I don't make them completely. Um, not to wait bare. If there is a plaster cast, they can walk on the plaster cast. Of course, after one week, once the initial pain comes down. But if the ankle is stable and immobilized, you can make them. But grade one, two, definitely we make them walk. I think yes, walk is something which gives a good uh, conditioning of the muscles and there's a good uh, you know, strength also. They won't, be have a, they won't be having muscle weakness after the position period is over. One more question is coming up. Can you somebody read that? Yeah, yeah. My, my ankle has started uh, twisting inside. Yeah. <laughs> While walking inside, ankle bone has slightly swelling and hurts a lot even with the walk. With rest, it is becoming better. You suggest a treatment for that. This is, this is actually the typical subset of patients what I was talking about. Repeated <laughs> injuries and probably osteochondral lesion in his thallus. Okay, Either okay. an osteochondral lesion or an uh, initial injury which was not addressed properly or immobilized yeah. properly, they can have an ankle instability. With the, uh, which is again a common thing and uh, they have to be examined for the instability of the ankle. If there is a, we do what is called as anterior posterior dryer's test in similar to the knee. If there is a significant instability, I think that that instability part also has to be ruled out and uh, some other lesions like a chondral lesions or some other injuries of the cartilage needs to be addressed. So I think they, I mean, whoever is it, Dr. Shan, uh, Shan, Shri Krishna. I think they, they, they are better to get it examined, better to ankle examined by orthopod and then properly address it. That would be the advice. Uh, from Kokila Devraj. Yeah. I'm doing daily treadmill and cross trainer, but I'm getting frequently knee pain and a click sound. Please, can you suggest a treatment for this age 35 years? Treadmill and cross trainer. See, treadmill... Especially cross trainers, I think it's because uh, it's involving more of a flexion extension, especially the body weight is too much. They'll be overloading the patellofemoral joint. Probably that may be the reason. Our uh, treadmill, which is at an inclined position, I think they have to uh, avoid. I think in any case, these kind of anterior knee pains, I really don't uh, recommend uh, them doing any kind of... Um, instrument uh, supported exercises like cross trainer or treadmill instead of that if they can go on a proper ground that may be even yeah, they can do okay. protect, protected and as i mentioned in my talk they have to address with the proper stretching of the quadriceps muscle and strengthening of the quadriceps muscle in an isometric way in a static way first and then do the dynamic strengthening where the body weight load is happening so better to take a physio's help Sir, aqua walk and cycling is better in this patient. Aqua walk. Mm. Aqua walk and cycling. I will switch okay. from treadmill to cycle. Yeah, uh, Kokila Devraj is thanking you, sir. Yeah, thank you. Sida, knee pain from past one month playing tennis. Sida. Loda. Sida having knee Hello, pain. Yeah, we'll call it today. These, keep, these questions will start creeping in now. Personal questions will start creeping in now. Yeah, yeah, as a moderate... I think, think so. I more. think... I think uh, yeah, I think gen generally we can uh, discuss than the personal uh, queries. Yeah, that's okay. what I said. Okay. Then uh, we'll call it ready. Uh, Dr. Dr. Malva Gowda, any... Uh, since you are a sportsman, any... Yes, uh, any advice on the orthotics and shoes. I think this is some topic we have missed uh, touching on in the debate. Footwear for runners? No, basically we use one good uh, good shoes, that's all. <laughs> so uh, most of the time I never use, uh, even I hit NAs, 
and except for the wristband i never use any uh, any other supports and uh, ultimately what we believe is we believe in warm, warming up and uh, uh, and uh, like uh, uh, what what to say uh, building the endurance and we believe in that so that's what most of the time i am not it started maybe in the future i may have to use it athletics <laughs> Hirag, I, I see the, the, this question. What you ask is an important thing in a runner, especially. I think now we have a, a foot and ankle specialist number one, and also we have podiatrist. And in fact, it may, if you go to the any of the sports shop, if you have recently visited the Adidas or Nike, these kind of shops, okay. uh, they, have, uh, they do have some advisors who have some basic knowledge about the foot axes and uh, arches. Uh, for example, I must tell you that because uh, if there is a pronated foot, completely pronated foot, if you give a arch support, they can do bad. And at the same time, yep. if you have a supinated foot, if their uh, heel is too much well supported, they can have pain. So and also they can, they are prone for uh, you know injuries of the ankle. So they are very important. I think I think the basic uh, deformity of the ankle should be examined by an orthopedic surgeon. And then, if it is uh, within falling within the normal variations, probably as Dr. Gowda said, any any kind of a good shoes, sports shoes will be doing. But if there are gross uh, deformities like pronation, supination, probably that requires a little different approach. Yes, sir. What else, Madhu? Yeah, we can connect it. It's getting time. Yeah. We... You give a word of thanks, no? Yeah. Yeah, on behalf of IMA Karnataka State Bank, I thank Dr. Chirag Fonsi, Dr. Rudra Prasad, and our moderator, my friend, Dr. Malave Goda, for extensive and really practical talk on the, the problems faced by the patients. As the fitness freaking has increased, Thank you very much on behalf of IMA Karnataka State Branch. Thank you, Maravagoda. Thanks, yeah. Dr. Chirag and Dr. Uh, Thank, Dr. You, Dr. Dr. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Madhusudan. Thank you. Thank you, Madhu. Thank you very much. Thank you. All take care. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Thank